Hello, I'm Ted Seides, and this is Private Equity Deals. This show is an exploration of deals in the private markets. Through conversations with private equity managers, we'll dive into individual deals to learn about deal dynamics, companies, and ownership that make private equity a force in institutional portfolios and the global economy. You can keep up to date and join our mailing list at CapitalAllocators.com. All opinions expressed by Ted and podcast guests are solely their own opinion and do not reflect the opinions of capital allocators or their respective firms. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Clients of capital allocators or guests may maintain positions in securities or managers discussed on this podcast. On the seventh episode of season one of Private Equity Deals, Trisha Glynn from Advent International discusses Orvion. Trisha is managing director at Advent, the global private equity firm that oversees nearly $100 billion in assets. Orvion Global is a collective of beauty brands specializing in the future of the face. Advent carved out three brands from Shiseido Americas to form Orvion in 2021. Our conversation covers the beauty business and the complex dynamics of a carve-out transaction, including sourcing, due diligence, and preparing to hit the ground running with a new executive team and a transition plan for the newly independent business. We then turn to Advent's plan to reinvigorate the brands, improve operations, and add value through M&A. We close with challenges in the current environment, lessons learned from the deal, and a roadmap for the years ahead. Please enjoy my conversation with Trisha Glenn. Trish, great to see you. Great to see you, Ted. Well, why don't we start with just a brief history about Advent? Sure. So the firm was founded in 1984 by a man named Peter Brook, who had been part of the founding of other private equity firms, actually, and had this idea that private equity and venture capital, as it was really called at that time, should be a global business. He spoke to his partners in his prior firm. They didn't want to do that in 1984, and he did. So he went for it. And the origins of Advent was a group of investors around the world that came together and started raising funds. And so if you fast forward all the way to today, that global nature of the firm is absolutely true in the roots of the firm, but also super present today. So today, 15 offices around the world. We continue to be growth oriented, not venture capital anymore. The industry's all evolved a lot, but growth oriented at scale and truly, truly global. It's also still a private partnership. We have a little under $100 billion in assets right now. I think it's $96 billion in assets. We invest in five sectors, which has been the case for a very long time, but technology, healthcare, industrials, business and financial services, and then the team I'm part of, consumer businesses, really, writ large. And, and I would say over the course of the firm's history, we have evolved the types of deals we do. And so today, it is a mix. It's a mix of backing founders, high growth businesses that sort of need scaffolding put around them or maybe increased investment to help grow and keep hitting the curve of what they can do or transformational deals, which are carve outs often or repositionings. But businesses where we still believe the future is growth, but for whatever reason, there's something that needs to happen today. So within those strategies, what are the consistent things that Advent tries to bring to bear on the investments that you make? Sure. So across the firm, when you're investing in five different large industries and you're investing all over the world, and you've got these two varied deal types, the growth at scale and this transformation, what goes across the board is the advent value system, which we talk about to every new hire in the firm and regularly as we get together as a team, but there's five of them. And so the first is to create long-term value for our shareholders. And the long term is a really important component to that. The second is to uphold the highest ethical standards in what we do. And to, again, that is consistent everywhere we operate. We reach firm decisions, meaning consensus-oriented decisions. This is a partnership still, and we believe in consensus, and we believe in investing the time to get to an answer that the group supports. The fourth value is that we support our executive teams. We support the management teams of the businesses we're in. And the fifth is to seek balance in life. 
And I have to tell you, when I was recruiting and speaking to the partners at Advent about joining deep into my private equity investing career, I saw that. It got my attention. I asked a bunch of follow-up questions, and we really do. It's a commercial place. We're focused on change. We're focused on really creating outsized returns. But there is this component of we care about our communities. We invest a lot philanthropically. We care about personal lives, whether you choose to have a family or not, like whatever it is, we care about the whole human. And in having that as the fifth value, it's going to impact how you do the other four things. So let's dive into Orvion, which sounds like it's kind of a mix of a few of these things. So why don't we start with the, just a description of the company and its history? Sure. So Orvion has existed since late December 2021. And that's because we named the business. But before that, it was three beauty brands, all owned by Shiseido when we bought them. So the beauty brands are Bare Minerals, Laura Mercier, and Buxom. Two of these businesses were founded by Leslie Blodgett at Bare Minerals. That's Bare Minerals and Buxom. And then Laura Mercier was founded by Janet Gerwich and Laura Mercier. And so you've got makeup artists, you've got great founder stories. And the businesses actually had been owned by a number of people over time before they came to Shiseido. Shiseido was looking at doing a shift in strategy, which they announced, a shift to more skincare. The business has been around for a long time. They're great, really well-known beauty brands, and they were a really small piece of Shiseido's sales today. And so we felt there was this great opportunity to pull them out into a standalone company. So what made it a fit for you at Advent? You said that these sound like both growth and transformation, and that's true. And so I would think of two deals our team did, this North American consumer squad at Advent in the last five years. One of those was Walmart Brazil. This is where we carved out 80% of Walmart's Brazilian operations. And then Walmart continued to own 20. We owned the business together. It was a full-scale turnaround in the Brazilian business, really successful and since exited. And I'd take Olaplex, which was high growth buying from a founder. But if you think of those as the two predecessor deals to Orvion, you've got both the hardcore transition turnaround operating shops. And by the way, Advent has done over 80 carve outs in our history. It is something we do a lot and we know how complicated and difficult they are. And then you take this deep dive into the beauty industry that we had with Olaplex, mash them together. That's sort of the idea of Orvion. Look, we were buying this coming out of the heart of the pandemic it is both that one, people are going to wear makeup. It's coming back. Just because we wore masks for a long time doesn't mean this is over. It's a belief in brands. Like we really care about brands in the beauty industry. And it's a belief that, you know, the whole point of a carve out is to bring new focus to this business. And so there's a bunch of things that focus brings to this business. One, private equity financial incentives for an executive team in beauty at this scale it doesn't exist everywhere. Two, you can set up the new infrastructure from scratch. So think about what we did with Olaplex, where you built the supply chain from scratch, the digital infrastructure from scratch, set up operating procedures from scratch, because that business was incredible when it was started by the founder, but didn't have the infrastructure to grow. We're, we're taking existing beauty brands that we think are really strong and plugging them into this brand new, call it like a new chassis almost, right? But this brand new business infrastructure to use and scale off of. With all these moving parts, what does it take to do carve out successfully? It takes a lot of people. And so the resources <laughs> inside Advent are tremendous, right? So I, the whole process map of all the people and all the resources in this is crazy big. But inside the firm, we have a number of different types of professionals. There's myself and my investment team crew. That's the deal team. We have the portfolio support group, which can sort of look at the entire thing going on and keep it all coordinated. And then we have a number of other types of folks inside the firm. And so if you look here, there is a nine-part value creation plan we're rolling out inside Orvion. It's digital, where we actually had an Advent employee serving as the interim head of digital here for months, which we don't usually do, but was really important here. We had a huge human capital effort with Advent employees supporting the business and setting up the executive team and team below. We have a marketing and brand positioning set of work, which I was personally involved with, but also a number of third-party resources and firms supporting the executive team, and then really granular work around IT, finance, HR, supply chain, procurement. And in each of those, you would have had Advent operations advisors. These are functional specialists, like best at what they do, working with them. You would have had Advent operating partners, 
One of our operating partners was the founder of Laura Mercier Cosmetics, actually. She's our operating partner in beauty. And so we had folks from all different parts of the Advent org that were supporting this business before we owned it and certainly now. So usually you think of a big conglomerate like Shiseido as having all these types of resources. And now you've got a business that's three brands. How do you think about paying for all these services in the context of this one company, Orvion? So we look at, well, one, we're always trying to be value-added investors. And so we invest in our own infrastructure, recruiting the best third parties to work with us, but also our internal Advent folks all the time. And then the question is, how many carve-out or transformations like this can you do at a time with those people? And the answer is, not every deal can be one of these. It also puts the pressure on us to do the transformational work fast. If we were still working actively on the carve out in Orvion three years into the deal, that would be a mistake for Orvion because they couldn't own their own destiny yet. And because all of those resources couldn't be working on other investments. And so there is this pressure, and I wanna say thoughtful pressure, but we all know that the safest way to glory is to do this work quickly, efficiently, and by the way, with a team that knows how to work together. And so while Olaplex is a very different investment, a number of the things we're doing in Orvion, we just did in Olaplex. We just set up the full financial infrastructure. We just set up the digital infrastructure. It was only two years ago. But if you look from when that team stopped working on Olaplex and ported over to Orvion, or stopped working on Walmart Brazil and ported in here, a lot of these folks have ongoing relationships with each other. And by the way, in some instances, this cost will sit on the Orvion p if they're hiring a third-party marketing firm. If it's an Advent operations advisor, that's on the Advent P&L. And so those people can really nimbly go in and out of these situations. But we're aiming to have a pull not push with our companies where they're asking for the help. And we also spend a lot of time aligning upfront on where do we all agree this makes sense to have Advent resources in? Where do we think you don't need them? Where do we agree to disagree? And we're going to figure it out in one or two quarters. But I do think this communication and transparency is really important because we're going to have FTEs in the company in the early days. And by the time we sell, our FTEs should be long gone because the business should be able to do this themselves. So when you have an existing business that doesn't have the incentives that you can bring with private equity, doesn't have the mission critical infrastructure that you think can optimize the business, what are the aspects of beauty businesses that make it attractive as a business as it was before you start adding in these things that make it a better business? Yeah. Well, I think that comes down to the fundamental strength of these brands, right? The beauty industry overall, I love this industry. It is a accessible way for people to invest back in themselves when you think about the end consumer. And it has been around forever. It will be around forever. There's plenty of innovation in the industry. There's a lot of talent. It's an industry where you can see some more diversity of leadership than you see in some other industries. So the industry itself has a lot going for it. But ultimately, even without the new supply chain and digital tools and everything else we'll give Orvion and we're giving them now, you have to believe in the brands themselves. And so a huge amount of our diligence was on bare minerals, down to the roots of it, the origin story, figuring out how we wanted to rebuild it. In Laura Mercier, same thing. We actually went back and spoke to the founders of these businesses and got them back involved when we did this investment. And so they don't want to run this business anymore. None of them do. But they do want to be around long enough to say, oh, you're messing it up. Oh, you haven't rethought the brand the right way. And we love that. In consumer investing, honoring the founder is a huge deal. And we care a lot about it. But fundamentally, you need to think the brands are good brands. They speak to consumers the right way. They respect them. They have the ability to be modernized. These brands were founded 30 to 40 years ago on average. Can they step forward and see a modern consumer that cares about different things around inclusion, different things around climate change and sustainability and biodiversity and sustainable packaging? The Orvion executive team is a modern executive team. They're spectacular. They're going to push these brands forward. We needed to make sure that the brands themselves can do that before we bought them. How do you underwrite the stickiness of a brand over time? So it is super complicated to explain in detail, but I would say fundamentally, we are trying to look at the heart of any consumer decision and figure out what's going on. So why is the consumer 
buying in this category, this product? Are they buying this good in lieu of something else that they'd like more? How excited are they by the purchase? Do they trust that when this brand or company puts out new products, will that be exciting? I talked to my team, what are the five whys, right, of what this company is or this consumer is buying for? But like go to seven whys if you need it. Keep digging in and figuring out, is this consumer putting up with this product, but they'd really like something better or are they truly excited? And if you have hero products, hero equities, a brand who knows what they should and shouldn't be doing next, where the consumer trust is and isn't, that's how you live for a really, really long time. So if you look in our history, right, brands like Lululemon, brands like Olaplex, they're in great markets. They have consumer trust to do other things, but they don't get that by accident. The first rule of brand investing is do no harm. Do no harm to the brand. Don't take tomorrow's sales today. Think about truly investing for the long term because it's really easy to lose the trust of consumers. When you get that right, what do the economics of one of these businesses roughly look like in terms of margins and flow through to profitability? Yeah. If you look in the beauty industry, margins are in the 20 to 30% range on EBITDA for businesses that, look, again, there's legacy products and high growth products, right? But you can have an attractive bottom line profile company. Gross margins can range from 40, 50 up to 80. And often when you're in categories, think Lulu, Lemon, think premium sportswear when that was the very beginning, in the highest affinity consumer interest categories, you can get a 75, 80% gross margin. The customer is willing to do that, even without IP in some cases that we have in some of our businesses. But said differently, people will pay for brands that they agree with, that they feel good about wearing or using, and that allows those brands to keep investing in innovation, talent, et cetera. So when you were looking at this acquisition, what were you concerned about? A ton. <laughs> so <laughs> it won, we did actually start talking about it in the middle of the pandemic when we were all masked up every day, right? Not that it's over by any stretch in the harm it's still bringing around the world, but we were looking when makeup sales were nil. And so that was part of it. When is this all going to turn around? We had to think about that. We had a view that it would at some point, but the question mark is, Will we have control of this business? Will we be in the heart of the messy carve out or will we have the ability to participate in the upside when we're coming back out? A second real risk in any carve out is the carve out itself. So these are not simple things where you pick a number and you all agree and high five and move on. They are complicated, massive documents that talk about transition service agreements, IP assignments, they get into the details of people. And so any carve-out deal is actually much more about the trust in the partnership because you're going to live together for quite a while. So the trust on both sides, buyer and seller, that you'll work through issues as they come up thoughtfully, that you'll respect the other party, that you will do right by all the important things that make up these businesses and price, but it's part of the whole. And it's one of the reasons, if you look at Advent's 80 carve-outs, we do carve-outs transactions with people where we really trust the other counterparty. Shiseido is a wonderful organization. Walmart's a wonderful organization. And if you look across the deals my partners have done in other sectors, you'll see the same. So let's dive into the carve-out itself. So where did this idea to create Oravion come from? The beauty industry is rarely an industry where you have a lot of independent brands that live forever as independent brands. There are benefits to scale to having multiple brands under one roof. We felt like the biggest players in the industry, Estee Lauder, L'Oreal, Shiseido, they've grown by M&A for 20 something years at scale and before then. And so the first idea was just, there have to be assets out there that are no longer getting the focus that they once thought they'd get and where the executives running them might wanna come on their own destiny. So that was the basic premise. The second one was around, okay, if you're going to do this and take this risk, with what brands? And so we did a lot of brand work to see where do we think there was opportunity, real opportunity to invest more time and money and improve the situation, but where you had a great stable foundation. That led to conversations with more than one big beauty player. And we ended up with this deal parameter that we were really excited about. The second huge piece of it is who's going to run it? How are you going to get excited? And 
this was one where if I had anything rumbling around in my stomach when we did this investment, it was, okay, now what, right? Because the beauty industry, most people work for big conglomerates and that comes with different upside, but different risk also. And so we had to go recruit the executive team. We started as anyone would at the top and recruited the CEO who's Pascal Hudaye, seasoned beauty executive, has grown through many beauty companies and started at P&G, which also have this reputation for incredible operating talent. And so we were really thrilled that this was an executive who had done acquisitions before, had run brands, had followership in people. And I'll tell you, the next six months in the trenches hiring that senior executive team with Pascal was a blast. And they're an incredibly talented team. I feel really, really lucky. But if you think across the board, our CFO, chief digital officer, chief supply chain officers, the heads of these brands, the head of our sales organizations, we've got a 15-person senior executive team that has been built from scratch in a very short period of time over the course of this year. So we took ownership December 2021 last year. The last new person hit the group in August and we celebrated finally having the full executive team there. <laughs> but it's this is like in the trenches, private equity. It's a blast, but they're a great team. I'm curious how you sequence there's an idea and there's this dynamic of trying to see if you can carve this out from Shiseido. You've got your due diligence on the brands and then you've got the need for an executive team. Walk me through the sequencing of those things. You cannot do it all at once. So we identified the idea in 2020. We were finally really in serious conversations with Shiseido. We had spoken to them already. But we were in serious conversations beginning of 2021. By August of 2021, we had signed the business publicly. Pascal was with us. Pascal was working with us. We were closing December of 2021. And actually, the extended close period that sometimes these carve-outs do require, just because of the complexity of all the pieces, that allowed us to get a lot of executive team hiring that fall. But for Advent, with our investment committee, my partners, there was this period of time where we all had to hold hands and say, we're buying a business we don't have the team yet for, but we believe we'll be able to hire them because the industry has a lot of talent in it. The industry has had growth for a long time. We have a CEO who has followership. And frankly, it's a big piece of advent strategy as well. We tend to look to begin to inflect the line of these businesses between signing and closing, even before closing. And that's in the DNA of the place. And so this idea that we're going to keep putting our shoulder into it, we're going to keep working through this is really well known and understood. And so we knew that was part of the risk the team was taking. Once the executive team is set up, you're still layering your strategy. And so this first year has predominantly been the carve out with Shiseido, the operations, the people and culture of the place that we're setting up. What are Orvion's values? What do they stand for? and getting the foundation laid for the future. We were investing in brand marketing. We were working on brand repositioning all year, but we haven't pressed go on the brand repositioning yet. I'm really excited for that, but that's a 2023 thing. We've seen the marketing. We're talking about all the product innovation launches for years to come. I think customers are gonna be really thrilled, but if we had tried to change the products while we were changing the supply chain, while we were hiring the team, that just felt too risky. In the process of getting this deal, most of these things don't go exclusively. So how did that play out from your initial conversation with Shiseido to actually inking the deal? In some cases, you never really know (laughs) all the conversations (laughs) that have happened. And they had owned the brands for a long time. And so I can only imagine. I know of some of the conversations they were having for the whole and for the individual brands. But over time... I can't imagine they had many conversations stress testing the value of each of these brands. Having said that, I'm not sure there's another private equity firm that would buy three brands that required this amount of effort all at the same time at this scale and size. These are big brands, right? This is not small. And so there was real operating risk in doing this deal. And so while I know they were talking to a couple other bidders over time, If we could make this work, there was mutual admiration and support between Shiseido and Advent, then this was the deal that made the most sense. Having said that, could they have peeled off and just sold one brand at some point in Simplified Life? Of course. When you were winning this deal, what actually happened in the competitive dynamic from the initial conversation to signing the documents? 
We were absolutely in a one-on-one negotiation. I have to imagine it was months, minimum month and a half, but I think it was probably two or three months. And so we had competition early in 21 for sure, but at some point it becomes really hard to run a legitimately competitive process when you're starting to get people on the phone with your head of internal IP or the internal head of of supply chain. And so you do sort of at some point have to pick a winner in carve out situations. So towards the end, we knew this was our partnership. My partner, Jim Westra always says you negotiate thoroughly in these carve out situations so that by the time you sign the deal and shake hands, you can put them in a drawer and never look at them again. That's the goal. But the idea is to think around all the corners and all the problems we're going to hit, talk about how we're going to handle them. And then once you're done with that, you're just running the business. The question is like, is that shipment going to go out on time? Are those components heading here? Where did like, it does get super granular and tactical. So anyway, the last days of this transaction look way different than most investments because you're literally going down to, okay, what day is the payroll going to shift over? What day is that going to change? You're pretty much there. You're at the very least at the back of the church already. And do you have an exclusivity at some point in time that comes in? Or is it just, you just know that Shiseido can't possibly be doing this with multiple people at the same time? You definitely know they can't be doing it with multiple people. And I'm going to look like a terrible deal maker here. And like, I can't remember at the very end if we (laughs) have exclusivity or not. I just can't. But you always, the no deal, that's the better answer. (laughs) The no deal is always a real thing people can decide to keep the business. They are running it today. And in most carve outs, if I was in Shiseido's seat, you're careful to not have the whole organization know. Because what you don't want is people to think that you don't want the business anymore. And then to think that they should leave if they're worried about deal breakage. I mean, it's another reason we did the employee town halls together and the employee communication together. Because we wanted everyone to be calm, know they were protected, know we care. Both sides care about the people a tremendous amount. What was the scale of the deal? What was the purchase price? The disclosed purchase price was $700 million. I know I winked at this and I did that on purpose knowing this question would be coming later. In any carve out, the devil's in the details, right? And so we put forward as much detail as we could. She said it was a public company, so I have to be careful. But there were terms around price, around funding, around timing of certain transitions, and then really in-depth work together on how we are going to run these businesses and brands. Let's dive into that a little bit. You mentioned services agreement, transition agreement, IP. How did you work through each of the core aspects of this deal? Let's start with IP. If you are going to buy a beauty business, you need to own the brand itself and the trademarks and what, like globally everywhere. That's easy. You need to own the actual products That's pretty easy too. It's pretty straightforward. No one really disagrees about that. The question mark is for innovation that's in the pipeline. The question mark is around Shiseido is a big company. What about formulations that might live across multiple brands or things that might be coming? Where do you draw the lines? And so it's actually a very complex, detailed conversation to make sure when we own Laura Mercier, we own Laura Mercier and we own its future and that you can actually separate the business from the other color cosmetic brands that Shiseido owns. And so it actually is a complicated conversation, unlike in Olaplex, where we were buying 100% of the business from the founder. They didn't have other brands, and so that's easy. It's like, do we take it all? (laughs) We take all the IP. But we felt like we came to a really good place with Shiseido, and everybody was trying to get to the same outcome. Everybody was truly trying to transfer all the IP that should belong with these brands over with them. People, which people are going to convey? How do you manage the very human issues around conveyance of employees? And so I had been meeting with the senior executive team along with my team for quite a long time and talking to them about potential roles, talking to them how we would work. We also spent time across the board. And so I went to the Shiseido headquarters before we had, after we had signed the deal, but before we closed and did a town hall in true Shiseido fashion with Ron, the head of North America, with the executive team that was coming on board and spoke to the whole team. It was the first time in my private equity career that I had hair and makeup done for an employee town hall, but it was great. (laughs) But the goal is to try and say, 
we understand that there's nervousness in any professional transitions. And this is coming from a incredibly well-known respected conglomerate into a new business. Pascal joined for that too. So they had the CEO and myself, and we were trying to truthfully give this focus of here's the values of the new system. Here's what we're excited about. While you don't have the heft of Shiseido behind you anymore, you have the heft of Advent. This is a large, well-known global organization who invests for growth, who has a winning record, but also a record of doing things the right way. And we were open to one-on-one -on -one conversations with as many folks as needed it to make sure that worked. And so it is, you can contract that all day long, but it comes down to people willing to trust you to come over into a totally new operating setup. We did have the executive team invest their own money in the deal. We also clearly have an options package in place for employees. And the idea is to have private equity, private incentives where the next three to five years can be much more lucrative for the people who are part of this business. And we hope a really incredible point in their career where they can be building something new, building something that hasn't been built before. When you're pulling out a business, there's the front side of this. There's the brands, there's the marketing, there's the salesman. Then there's all the infrastructure, accounting, systems, IT that sits in the big mothership. I know there's different ways to do it. How did you decide to do it in this case? So we handled them each a little bit differently. In supply chain, by almost always, you've got some period of time by which you actually don't change how products are manufactured. And then ultimately you do. And so the question is always, how long are you sitting with the original arrangements? How do you pay for those? Are there markups or costs? How are you handling all that? So there's a set of agreements around manufacturing and supply chain. There's a set of agreements around finance. For some amount of time, you have data coming over in old systems versus new systems. There's for sure transition service agreements around IT. That was one of the biggest pieces of the Walmart Brazil transaction with Walmart was the IT transition service agreement because all the data for Walmart Brazil was in Bentonville for that transaction. Here, the most complicated thing was really the manufacturing of the products. In a beauty business, the number of SKUs, the complexity, changing up beauty lines, that was the hardest part. And it's detailed and it's the transition service agreement that went out the longest as well. So once you own this business, you've done all this work in a very short period of time to bring in this full management team. There were executives running this within Shiseido. And now you have a different management team running it alongside the other employees that presumably were there all along. How do you bring that together? You know, it's not easy. And the people who are running this at Shiseido, some are with us, some are in new phenomenal gigs, some are elsewhere in Shiseido, right? It's a moment of transition for a lot of people. Most carve-outs happen because the business you're carving out is less than 1% of sales for the person selling it. It doesn't make sense for them to focus differentially. It doesn't mean they don't want those brands to be successful. I truly believe they do. And likewise, we respected everything they do. They're beautiful creators of product, high quality product. It's a company with tremendous values. And so we, everybody was happy to work together. There are frictions still. There are decisions you might want to make differently. There's just the human nature of new executives in certain places. But big picture, everybody wants this to succeed. And so that goes a long way. And this comes back to only pick the carve out partners that you really want to go with when things go wrong, because they will. But day to day, at this point, the new executive team really has a ton of running room. A lot of the hard investments have been made. We are not completely done with transition, but we're further along than we thought we would be. And we are now really pretty close to moving mentally to the part of this deal, which is about reinvigorating these brands, really ramping the investment behind them, changing the distribution in certain cases, mostly overseas. The domestic distribution is pretty well set, but there's, we think, really big revenue upside for the brands from here, which is fun for everybody to work on. And even M&A, which was part of the original thesis, which we haven't talked about yet, but that was always part of the thesis. So let's dive into those aspects of the strategy. The first is, what are you doing to reinvigorate the brands? So part of it is just spend, real focus on the spend. But a big piece of it is also both visual merchandising, the look of the creative that's going out, and I would say refocusing the brand identities. And so Pascal and his executive team and the brand leaders did deep work around truly understanding what the consumer believes the brands stand for today, 
and where that might need to shift in 2022 versus when the brands were originally created. Some of it you'll see show up in the artistic presence. Some of it is in what type of innovation would you do or not do in this brand today, but trying to be consistent. The world is a loud place to consumers. If you're not really consistent about your brand image and message, it can get lost. And I would say these are brands that needed a focusing. They become a little blurred, not broken, but blurry. And so that's been a huge piece of it. And then once you have that focused perspective, spend behind it, get out ahead of the market, innovate new products that are in line with that vision. This whole year has been planning for that. And we've been able to make some changes, but in 2023, you'll see a lot more. What have you found most effective in getting ROI on ad spend, given how much is changing in the digital world from, say, traditional ad spends for brands? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's been such a complicated issue for any brand investing the last few years. The changes around privacy, the changes Apple has implemented, the shift of dollars to Google more than anything. I think you've seen a lot of direct-to-consumer brands shift to their own stores, their own website, even more if they could. The good thing about these beauty brands, or one of the many good things, is we are actually sold in channel as well. We're not D2C brands. While we have our own websites and those are wonderful, and we love if you go there, anyone listening, we sell a lot in Sephora. We sell a lot in Ulta. We sell a lot at high-end department stores around the world and other channels, other direct-to-consumer specialist channels. So these are brands where we actually can get the customer to see what we look like, how we show up, what we're selling as they walk through a Sephora or an Alta. And so a huge piece of it is to make sure we're showing up thoughtfully in every channel in which we sell and get the social media right and get the paid marketing and spend right. So it's not to say, look, performance marketing is really important, but it's part of an overall picture for these brands. How about m and we're going to do it. I said this on the original town hall, which just say to employees, like, send us ideas. So we've been looking this year. The goal was always to get through this first transitional year as much as we could before really amping into M&A spend and time. But if you look at the beauty industry, many brands can live together in single houses really effectively. And while when you get too big, I do think this need for divestiture again that led to Orvion is real, I would expect to see more beauty companies do it. In the past, you've actually seen some beauty companies shut brands down when they get insufficient focus versus sell them, but why not sell them? There should be this group of buyers who would be willing to do a transaction like this. But for Orvion, we've looked at new acquisitions. The company upon founding, Pascal's vision was this, the future of the face. And so living by the right ethical standards, living it in a planet conscious and inclusive way, But think about the future of the face. Truly caring for the human face is like an 11-step process. We're currently selling three or four of them. And so whether it's skincare or makeup or even technology, we're going to be looking for brands that fill in that focus and brands that can really take advantage of the digital infrastructure we've built, the supply chain that we've set up, and the executive talent, not for nothing. When I think about it, looking at what that executive team is capable of. They've all run much bigger businesses. And so you'll see multiple deals from this business. And for anyone listening, feel free to send me ideas. (laughs) I'm curious how you thought about financing this transaction, because you have three profitable businesses that you're looking at it as growth. You're thinking about M&A. What kind of cap structure did you put on it originally? So it's a very simple capital structure. It is equity and a seller note from Shiseido. And that's it. And so we actually did not take outside debt, really. We do have the ability to do some over time. The beauty businesses will often asset back some of their revolver facilities. And certainly there's a history. The industry can take leverage. This is fairly stable through downturns in the world. This is a high margin industry. And so we've got optionality, but the risks of a turnaround are the risks of a turnaround. They're real. And so we wanted to be unlevered effectively in the early years and then can be thoughtful about a capital structure. But I should have said this up front. If you look at Advent's returns since the beginning of the fund's creation, going back a very long way, our returns have been predominantly driven by EBITDA growth or multiple expansion in our control, like shifting a business into a different type of industry or a different quality of business or scaling into a different level versus just market multiple expansion. 
And so we really are trying to change businesses for the better. And so the goal is to see that here too. What happens to the day-to-day operations of a business like this in this year of time where there's so much transition happening on the business itself? And by the way, it's 2022. And so you've got supply chain challenges everywhere. You've got inflation that everyone's dealing with. You're still thinking about the future labor model, work from home, not work from home. So let's take those each piece by piece. The beauty industry has had supply chain challenges. We have certainly had them too. It's not great to have supply chain challenges in your first year as a new business, but we would have been hustling after them anyway. And the fact that the whole world is dealing with it at the same time, I would hope that that means the infrastructure of an advent can help change some of those problems. This was not the only investment where there was for supply chain people, but we have phenomenal people inside advent that can get into those situations and really try to fix things. And so supply chain's complicated and the business has done an incredible job trying to work through it. What are the types of things that you can bring to the table to try to work through the supply chain that the businesses couldn't do on their own? Yeah. Part of it is power with certain people in the chain to try to just get people to listen to the problems. Everyone is busy. And when you're a supplier who has an issue supporting everyone in your client stack, knowing that this business is part of a big corporation, it helps with that. Part of it is strategy. Part of it is just day-to-day hustle. Part of it is just our investment and portfolio support group team being in such close concert with the executive team that they know we are supportive of air shipping that component to that place to get those products out of time. Or we are supportive making some one-time investments to fix the problem because we care way more about the end consumer being happy than our profitability this year. That's been consistent. And so nimbleness of decision-making is probably the most important piece. And then long-term focus, something that's easier in a private setting than a public setting for sure. How are you navigating this uncertain and volatile inflationary environment that I'm sure is affecting both the cost inputs and, of course, the price on the shelves? Yeah, these are brands with pricing power. They're good brands. The beauty industry holds up well in tough times. I would just say the whole industry has had to take some price this year. It would be better for consumers everywhere if that wasn't true in the future. The actual impact of inflation on a consumer segment is highly tied to the income of that consumer segment by socioeconomics. These are premium brands. And so for the most part, consumers buying these brands can afford them and are less impacted by the day-to-day inflation you see in the world. And so you're just in a more protected segment. But big picture, it's of course an issue for consumers globally that we all need to be focusing on. But that has not been the primary issue with these businesses. I was going to come back to the third issue I mentioned, which is this work from home environment. When you're in a brand new business that is setting up culture for the first time, we had a hard set of decisions to make about whether we were going to try and really get people back to the office or whether we were going to live by the work from home regime that more of the beauty industry is still following. And we really went employee friendly for this. The executive team is pretty much together all the time. That is how they're choosing to work. But there's been a tremendous amount of flexibility for people to be in the office or not in the office as they see fit. And so you've seen a blend of it, but we've not mandated everyone come back. And so the team has invested heavily in town halls and virtual get togethers. The executive team has been flying around the world and seeing the folks we have in different places. So we're building a culture while respecting individual autonomy. And that's hard. And so that's, again, where I'm just so grateful for the executive team we have that's finding a way to balance that. What have you learned in that balance? Everyone's really struggling with this idea that, sure, if you already have a culture, you already have employees, it at least works for a while. Productivity was pretty good. How do you train new people? How do you bring people up the chain? What's Orvion seeing in this hybrid model? Yeah, I think the work for people professionals, HR professionals, people professionals, the last three years has just been beyond challenging. And keeping a pulse in the organization is really hard. I would say it's working right now. And as a board member across any of my businesses, I am constantly looking for smoke signals that something may not be working. I'm constantly looking for an understanding that culture may be breaking down or ideally that it's getting stronger. But I just think we don't know yet. 
we're going to look back five years from now and maybe we will know when we had major insights or not. Today, I'm still focused on non-voluntary turnover. I'm focused on any rumblings we hear of issues in any business. And executive teams need to stay really innovative. So the other smoke signal I have is if it feels like we're doing the same thing we did in 2020, that's probably a problem. Orvion didn't exist then, to be fair, but, but looking for an executive team who's continuing to look for new ways to get people together. I see that inside Advent too. We get our entire workforce together as Advent. We call it our worldwide meeting. We do it once a year. And this was the first year that we had been able to do it in four years here in 2022. And it was magic to get everyone together again. And so continuing to fund our businesses' ability to do that sort of stuff, bigger in-person events than they used to. But more than that, it just people as sort of first or second on the agenda every board meeting has been for a few years and will continue to be until we have a bit more clarity on how this is all going to keep evolving. So you had a bunch of known challenges going into this deal, the complex carve out, the environment, anything come up that was unexpected? We actually didn't know the inflation would be as bad as it was this year. We didn't know the supply chain challenges would be as bad as it was. We didn't know there would be war in Europe and trying to rethink one, just supporting employees that are all over the world. And so there are plenty of unknowns. If I stay away from the hard geopolitical ones, because they're not core to this investment in particular. The biggest piece is always the people. It's always communication. It's always this culture building we were just talking about. And I would say to be coming out of the pandemic in how people change their behavior right into this period of time where it feels like we may have a consumer downturn again, or we're in one, or it's coming soon, right? That's not a great setup for anyone. And it just goes back to, I'm really glad we buy brands that we really like. We Advent, we're not in the business of buying things on their last legs and cutting costs. That's not what we do. We're buying brands that we think we can grow for 10, 15, 20 years, maybe more, right? And so that's where maybe you end up owning a business longer than you originally intended, but it's all going to be okay. And so with Orvion, we're one year in, we're ahead of schedule on the carve out work, which was the foundational work we had to do. We're ahead of schedule on the executive team build out. And so we feel we're excited. We're thrilled. I'm willing to talk to you 10 months in, (laughs) talk about it in detail. So we feel really good. But man, yeah, there's a ton of challenges that come every day. So it's premature to talk about an exit strategy down the road. Why don't you lay out a map of what do the next couple of years look like? Sure. So we are going to finish the full transition carve out so that the business is really standing on its own two feet. We are continuing to invest in the digital infrastructure of the business. And so customers will see that, employees will see that. Being a modern company that's got data science and like best in class app and consumer engagement and website, that'll be really visible. And then on supply chain product and innovation, I know I said in beauty, it's like all about the products, number one. That will be a huge focus. These brand relaunches, the products, I'm really excited for all those things. Ultimately, we think this business should be a standalone business that does M&A, that is able to keep doing M&A and growing through inside innovation and outside innovation. Ultimately, we could decide to sell brands individually too, whether they're brands we own today or brands we buy. But this idea of a nimble beauty business that can grow by acquisition and divestiture and refocusing, that ultimately it is about the executive team, the full squad and the cultures that you've driven, and then this investing in a nimble way in an industry that hasn't been able to have that with private equity incentives, private company incentives, and a value structure to create something truly unique in the beauty world. And so that could be, we could sell a business, we could sell brands, We'll certainly buy brands, but I do think this could be a standalone public company for a long time. Some of those aspects of innovation, sort of technology, apps, best in class, how do you think about what Advent uniquely brings to bear or the internal management team that's put in place will just go off and do that on their own? Yeah. So I think it is, one, understanding that these things are really critical And you need a real head inside the company and not shying away from recruiting that person, incenting them, giving them running room to play. When I started working with 
Lululemon, Tom Waller was the head of innovation there. Phenomenally talented individual. If you look at Olaplex, Lavinia Papaskew is the chief science officer and Orvion, Mike Wong is the chief science officer. And you notice, by the way, chief innovation officer, chief science officers, these are real jobs, right? These are real focus areas. And when you've got a C-suite member of a team, that person is going to have team, budget, focus, airtime at executive meetings. So investing in innovation is a huge piece of the puzzle. Second is how much is innovation going to be a buzzword versus a real piece of the business? We are tracking what are the long-term pipelines for projects? How much are we spending on those versus core? What is the shift of the business over time? And then how are we supporting those people through systems, data science, spend, budget, et cetera? When something like an Olaplex patents formation, understanding the true scientific breakthroughs. And so it's a huge deal. And when you invest in growth, this should be a part of all of our businesses. She said at the onset that one of the aspects of this industry is that it has shown that it benefits from scale, that you can have multiple brands under and there are benefits that accrue to that rather than the individual brand. Where are you when you have three brands compared to Shiseido, who had many, many more in extracting those benefits over time? Partway on the journey, I think is the right answer. <laughs> now, if you look at the beauty industry overall, the indie brand movement was getting a lot of press five, 10 years ago. And these were small startup brands that used Instagram and Facebook and those to build brands. And then ultimately those indie brands then got sold to Estee, L'Oreal, Shiseido, Kao, right? The industry can absolutely fund innovation. The question to me is, can you do that at scale for a long time and not get an early great idea, but a set of great ideas that you can fund over the long term? And so I think we're big enough to have really innovative products. We're really, we're big enough on data science and digital infrastructure. We're big enough to have this quality and executive team. You know, ultimately there will be benefits through supply chain and through international distribution if this business were to ultimately be owned by a strategic again. And so the way to not need that to happen is to keep buying brands and investing. So I would say part way. What have you been your biggest lessons learned from this particular deal relative to your other experiences? There's this thing in all investments, right? You work so hard outside in, and then in the first three months, in the first six months, you really know what you bought. This one was interesting in that we had so much to do that was in our own control that this year we have been burning a tremendous amount of resources. You know, one thing we said in this investment and on Walmart Brazil back in 2018, the biggest cost is going to be time of advent resources. These are precious resources, but this is the biggest cost versus the purchase price. And so this year was a ton of time and effort from everybody. It has gone really well, knock on wood. We're ahead of schedule. We're really excited. And so I think the important lesson is actually just keep reminding ourselves things could keep getting bumpy from here, period. The world can keep changing. We don't know what next year looks like. And so keep thinking about, would we own this business five years from now? Would we own it 10 years from now and invest with that mindset? And that's how it will all be okay. <laughs> all right, Trish, I have one last question for you, which is what is your favorite aspect of private equity? I have had the same answer since I started my career. And so I started as an analyst in the private equity group of Goldman Sachs. Then I spent a long time with Bain Capital private equity. And then I came over to Advent as a partner in 2016. And so I've been really blessed to work with great people and have these great environments to invest in. But I would just say, since the very beginning, the thing that hooked me back at Goldman Sachs is the learning in this business. And so getting to dive into new industries, new businesses, as you progress in your career, learning completely new skills that you didn't have five years earlier, right? It is very different to be analyzing and building a model in your early 20s, to be chairing the board of a company and having the accountability for those people, to be partnering with executives through a global pandemic when you're trying to figure out how to support everyone the right way and make the right decisions. And so the leadership challenges at this point are trying to build teams to have long careers and do the right thing, look where the world's going. Those are the pieces that are the learning that I love the most today, but it is just the variability, the variety. It's a tremendous opportunity for that. Well, Trish, thanks so much for sharing this interesting and early success 
carve out story and obviously wishing you the best of luck as it continues the next couple of years. Thank you very much. We will always take all the luck we can get. Thanks for listening to the show. If you like what you heard, hop on our website at capitalallocators.com where you can access past shows, join our mailing list, and sign up for premium content. Have a good one and see you next time. 